Welcome to this uh, spooky Halloween session on um, a very horrible and spooky topic, testing. Um, who of you likes to test? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some laughs. Okay, a few people. Okay, that's good. Um, so in this session I want to show you how to make uh, testing less spooky, less horrible, less haunting, right? And even to make it a little bit joyful. So this will be a session how to be more effective when writing tests, and especially when we have bigger, more complex projects, how to manage tests more well, effectively, how to make them more maintainable. So about myself, my name is Sebastian, born and raised in uh, Munich, Germany. And this is actually my first time in Cluj. I've been to Romania before, I think three times. Um, but I'm especially happy to be here during Halloween and where to celebrate Halloween at a better place than Transylvania, right? So that's why also the spooky outfit. And yeah, I do a lot of things in Enterprise Java, so I have a background with enterprise software in general and Java and anything that an enterprise project needs. So this is also always my focus. I am focusing on real-world um, solutions and especially projects that do real-world testing. And we're going to have a look at a few of these things. So what I will show you, besides Halloween, I like coffee. So this is why I have a coffee. Oh, where's my coffee here? A coffee shop example application, which I'm going to show you in a second. And also one thing I want to show you right away is a more, well, at least a complex enough example. Because that is already one issue that I, or, you know, problem that I see, um, that testing the examples are very often, you know, conference talk driven or, you know, article blog post driven. And it's a huge difference whether you write a single test with a Hello World like example or whether you actually have a real world project with many, many test scenarios. Because mostly the difference in testing technology and approaches only emerges once you have, you know, a more complex scenario. So what I'm going to show you is a coffee shop example that is at least complex enough where we have, well, two applications being involved and a database. So at first, what we're going to have is a coffee shop application that at least already has a database, so there will be some persistence involved. And, you know, we're going to test all of that, of course. And then we're going to have a barista system, you know, that friendly barista person who brews your coffee, where we communicate with, but also to make it more interesting in an asynchronous way. So that this will be a little bit more complex, at least for our testing purposes. And then, of course, we're going to test that project. And while well, slides are boring, it's more scary to have code, right? So I'm going to uh, show you live demos and live coding. This is my um, example application. That is a Maven um, application that has my coffee shop project. We're going to focus on this project. So this is the application that we want to test, our coffee shop. The coffee shop is used from the user to well, order coffee, so we're going to talk to that uh, application and then we store the coffee orders in our database and things like that. So that is a Jakarta um, application. For most of the topics that I will show you, it actually doesn't matter which enterprise technology we use, whether that's in um, Jakarta EE, whether that is Java EE, whether it's Spring, it's very similar approaches. And just to make it more spooky and scary, I use Java 12. Who of you uses Java 12 or 13 in production? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, very scary, I know. OK, who of you uses Java 9, 10, or 11? Hands up. OK, a few, that's good. And the rest, I guess, Java 8? Yeah, OK, everybody else. Anyway, so you can try that out already. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to deploy that then using a modern runtime, Open Liberty. I also have some stickers and even some t-shirts. By the way, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Normally, I don't say that, but this time I actually have some more presents, not only stickers, but t-shirts from Open Liberty. Not this one, but different ones. And if you ask a really good question, you might get a t-shirt. And if you don't ask questions, you get one anyway, because I will not take them back home. So. Um, what I'm going to show you, local builds, I want to run and test this example now. I will test it, first of all, in a manual way, just as a you know, human being. And for that, I quickly run you through the code of the coffee shop application or of this path where we're actually going to create some order to get some coffee. So this will, uh, is a JAXOS resource that is just an HTTP endpoint. If you're familiar with Spring, this is very similar to Spring REST controllers. 
we're going to have a path slash orders where we're going to, you know, can get some coffee orders, can create some coffee orders using JSON. And then one of the main paths is to create a coffee order by basically, well, posting some JSON to that resource. And then the main step to do here, and that's not super interesting, we have one business component, our coffee shop class, where we just use the database to store that order, right? So we store that order in the database, then it's in the system, and later on in an asynchronous way that will be submitted to the barista system. And that's pretty much it. And once we have that up and running, local run environment, what I'm going to show you is this example running locally. I use Docker to run this using Docker containers. That's very simple to set up locally, and that's already a very good technology to test because you, know, you can quite easily replicate what you would do in a production-like example by basically running the same images, right? running the same application that runs in production later on, just now with one coffee shop, one barista, and even a database. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run these things in Docker. I have three containers running now, one Postgres for the database, one coffee shop application, what I just built, and the other one is called Barista. Okay. And then once that is up and running, we can actually test our application. So let's do this. This runs um, under port 8000. We have a few ports mapped here. So that means we can run this um, locally using curl localhost, port 8001, and the application is called Coffee Shop. Then we have resources, which is, let me show you, that is the default uh, path of my JAXRS application, just because I name it that way, and then orders in order to ask for coffee orders. Okay, this works, application JSON, empty JSON array, there's no order in the system yet. Okay, let's change this in order to create an order. Well, we're gonna post some JSON to this resource, right? This is what you saw in um, the HTTP example. So this is now what a client would do, maybe using a mobile client, maybe using an app, right? It would use HTTP to communicate with our application. So in this case, I'm gonna post some JSON here to, well, create a coffee order. And the coffee order looks like follows. It has you know, a coffee type and it has an origin. So if you go to a nice coffee shop, sometimes you can select you know, where the coffee beans come from, you know, like an exotic country like Ethiopia and things like that. So let's say we're going to post some uh, JSON to this resource, application JSON, and say we want to order, I don't know, espresso? Espresso. And let's say the origin that we have is, you know, a country like, I like coffee from Colombia. Okay, let's do this. And then what we have, okay, 201 created. That's good news. And we have, well, something that already tells us the order might be in the system now. Let's check. Okay, this looks good. Now we have one order under our orders resource, coffee um, co from Colombia, and the status is collected. Okay, the status is already collected because that status has been updated asynchronously quite quickly using this barista backend. And it's, um, it has different statuses. And now because I wasn't fast enough, let me try this again. Now it has different statuses like finished and then afterwards it will be collected. So they're uh, preparing, finished, uh, collected, three statuses and collected as the end state of my coffee. So that is the communication that happens between these two systems. All right, now that is quite a manual way to test it. I just tested that I can create some coffee order, some espresso from Colombia, and it looks good, it works. I created it, it's in the system, I can query the system, so apparently it's in the database. I can even have a look in the database, right? And also the external communication with the barista backend, it worked, right? Because the status was updated. Okay, now let's focus on this first. How do I test this? Well, I just tested it, right? But in a somewhat manual way. That is probably not the best way to test this in a project, right? Because that would mean every time I want to deploy something, I have to go through this example, you know, using curl or any other approach or postman or a browser to create the coffee and to validate as a human whether that works. Okay, so then we already come to the question, why do we do testing? We want to make sure, we want to validate that our application works later on, right? And there are many different test scopes, and this, what I just did manually, is a very end-to-end -end system test-like scope, if you want. 
So I connect to my running application using the same endpoints that a client would use, right? And then I just see what the outcome is. Now, that is already the first scope that I want to focus on. I want to write a system test in a way that does what I just did, but in a you know, more automated way. Ideally using Java, because that's what we um, typically use, right? So what I have now, I, uh, this is the main application project, and I have a second project. And I outsource this into a second project for good reasons. This is called Coffee Shop ST for a system test project. And what it is, it is a separate project that is not tangled with the uh, main application project that is standalone using any other technology. You know, it could be curl and then you write your test in bash script, right, by just automating what I just did, or you use Python, or I use Java because I'm a Java programmer and I'm the most efficient in that. But the point is I totally want to isolate these technologies to only test my application from the outside. So the what I use here is, well, in this case, JUnit, and then some things like um, JAXRS for a client. I can also use Rest Assured or whatever we want to do. And then I want to write a um, an, um, system test for that. So let's have a look here. I'm going to create one called end-to-end, -end, whatever, test. And now what I want to show you is, just as an example, a not best practice, but a typical example how these end-to-end -end tests or system tests are typically written in projects or what I mostly see. And then we already come to the topic of how to write maintainable tests, right? So let's say we want to have test create coffee order. We want to do now the same thing that I did on a command line in a programmatic approach, right? We want to validate whether we can create a coffee, right? So let's say, and I'm going to deliberately start writing just in you know, comments, or you could do that on paper, what I want to test. I want to create a coffee order with Espresso from Colombia. How do I do this? Well, we just saw it. We have to post something to HTTP resources, right? So I, have, I write something like post, something to you know, slash orders. And what you post is you know, a JSON using type espresso and origin Colombia, right? And then what do I do? Well, I need to verify whether that works. So I see whether the connection works and whether the status code is 201 created, right? Something like this. OK. And then I also want to see whether it's in the system correctly. So I would use you know, a GET request to see whether my order has been created. OK, now let's say GET request and then orders. Well, I need the order ID, so hang on. Here I get, if you paid attention, I got an HTTP location header, which contains the location of my, let's say, order ID. So assume that should be this location, right? And then we have something like this where we just get a new coffee order that we just created. And then let's say verify that the JSON basically looks as follows, right? Verify that this is the case. OK, and then verify HTTP 200, OK, and things like that, right? So this is how you would write a system test. Of course, now only using pseudocode or comments, but then what you would do is HTTP, make a post call, create that JSON, send it here, assert that it's 201 created, and things like that, step by step, right? Who has seen tests like that? Right, yeah, a few of you. Okay, now the question whether that is a good idea or whether that is maintainable, because what happens? You have now one test for Espresso from Colombia. Now, tomorrow, you're going to implement also Cappuccino from Colombia, right? So what happens? Well, of course, you take this test, you copy-paste, you say, oh, there's a naming uh, mismatch, so this is going to be Cappuccino, and the other thing is Espresso. And then, of course, you're going to have a good look and say, okay, here is Espresso, that's going to be Cappuccino. And here is Espresso, that's going to be Cappuccino as well. And then, you know, your test is updated, right? Good idea. OK. And then the next sprint, you're going to implement not only Colombia, but let's say Ethiopia, a different origin. And then you can already guess what's going to happen. Well, this is not the best idea. Because what you do, your test code contains just way too much stuff. Or in other words, it contains too many responsibilities or too many abstractions at the same time, right? 
So, I mean, you can imagine that if we kind of copy paste always this at some point, not only it's a lot of code to manage, but also you totally lose the overview, right? You don't see what you're actually testing. You don't see, you know, anything that is buried here in HTTP code, JSON code, HTTP status logic, some uh, data in the middle. So that is not the best idea to make maintainable tests, right? And now the question, what happens if, let's say, JSON changes, the JSON format changes from this structure to something else? Well, then you're screwed, right? You have to go to all the methods and change that everywhere. Or even worse, what's what when change when XML changes uh, when JSON changes to XML or to protobuf or to something else, right? Or when HTTP changes to something else, well then you can throw away these tests, right? There's no chance. Well, maybe not the best idea. Let's delete this. And let's start from scratch. And that's the reason why I deliberately start coding in comments or sometimes coding on paper to ask yourself the question, what do we actually want to test? What is the test scenario that we want to have? And then think about proper abstraction layers and proper delegates that we want, might want to craft. So what do we test here? Well, we create a coffee order from Colombia with type espresso, right? So we're going to write this exactly in this way. Create coffee order with espresso from Colombia, right? And now, then, we want to verify, let's say, order ID, something like this, or order ID. Verify whether after we have been created, that is the case, then this order, order with order ID, has type espresso and is from Colombia, right? Something like this. That is now the test scenario that we want to have. Nothing more. We don't talk about HTTP. We don't talk about JSON. The user doesn't care about HTTP and probably doesn't know about JSON, right? But that is the test scenario, the actual business domain scenario that we want to test. So let's write it in that way. And then what we do, we separate these concerns by introducing, introducing proper delegation, right? To delegate, for example, how we create a coffee order or how that is you know, being verified and things like that. And then if you do it in that way, you end up with something like this. I have create order test, that is now the same thing, that are now implemented. And as you can see, that is a plain JUnit test that now uses, well, two classes. One is called coffee order system, whatever that is. And now our create verify order test introduces, well, just a little bit of code. We say now in Java, Please create a new order. New order, Espresso Colombia. Yeah. New order with Espresso from Colombia. And then say something like, order, coffee order system, create order. Right. We don't talk about HTTP. We don't talk about JSON. Just create order. Then we get some identifier back. And then we say, oh, now please get the order. Get that order back and use SOJ or whatever to verify whether you know, the type and the origin matches the expected data. And then if we want, we can say, also now give the full list of order and see whether that identifies in that list, right? Whether the identifier is basically included here. And that's it. That is our test scenario. So that is readable. That is easy to change. And with the first look with these, well, what's that, five lines of codes, you ideally immediately see what is going on. What is my scenario? Now, how that is implemented, well, first of all, we don't have to care, but let's say we do care, then we have a look at the coffee order system. Now, that is the delegate where we just delegate that low-level logic to, which in our case is a simple HTTP client, right, where we connect to something like localhost, and then say, okay, please get orders, what is it? Well, in this case, it's going to be a get request to this and this. Um, URL or create order is going to be a post request by sending this. And as you can see, we can already do some lower level verification to verify whether the HTTP status code is correct, right? We don't verify that in the upper test scenario because we don't care about HTTP codes. But here we do care. We want to see whether that is the case, right? So here we're going to verify that. So actually, this is nothing new. This is just proper code quality. But now, in this case, applied not to production code, but to test code. That is not forbidden. It's actually a good idea. 
to do some refactoring to introduce proper code quality, mostly separation of concerns and proper abstraction layers into your test scope. And if you see that, well, now you have a very maintainable system test that just creates some coffee here. All right. Now, we're going to run this in a second. Um, but also, what we have, we have a more complex scenario that not only creates some coffee order in a synchronous way, checks whether it's there and that's it, but we also have some more communication. We have a coffee shop system and we have our barista system. And now what you typically do in different test scopes, like in unit tests, you want to focus on what is called the object under test. Might be a class. In this case, it's a whole application. In this case, it's our coffee shop. And then you simulate or you mock everything else where you're not interested in, right? And in this particular system test, what we want to focus on is the coffee shop, and then we want to mock the barista, because right now we don't care about the barista. So similar to unit tests, we're going to mock this. In this case, it will be a mock server. I use WireMock, right? It's an HTTP mock server, and then we can basically in the same way like we do with a mock, we can control how the mock will respond. And later on, we will verify whether the communication was correct, right? Very similar to what Mockito does. We can just say, OK, now, barista, please respond in this way or respond in that way, and then verify whether the communication was correct, right? So what we're going to do later on, we're going to create a new coffee order. And now in this case, we're going to see whether the communication is correct, right? If we create a coffee order, it's there, it's in the system. But now we know our system must send that information, the status, to the barista system in an asynchronous way. And actually, we'll do that multiple times to update that status gradually. So what we do in order to verify that, well, we go to the barista system after we created some order, just as before, and then say, hey, barista, in a second, you will receive a new order that just has been created. And once that is the case, please respond with that code, right? Respond with that response. That's now it, it's preparing, right? So what the barista system will do Let's have a look at that. It's also just an HTTP client, but in this case, it will connect to, well, WireMock. So it assumes that our barista is actually not a barista, but a WireMock, mock server, where we just say, OK, now connect to it. And then in this case, please return with uh, you know, the following status, and so on and so forth. So please, for this resource, do an HTTP OK with JSON, and then respond appropriately, right? So answer for order will give us if we post something here with the following content, then please respond with that status. OK. Make sense? Good. Now, in this case, what happens? OK. No. In this case, what we're going to do, well, we're going to verify whether that is the case. And then in order to wait and verify for this connection, well, we actually have to do that. We have to wait. Why? Because it's an asynchronous communication. We don't know, once we created the coffee here, that it's already immediately being sent to the barista. Right? So the best thing actually we can do is to, well, wait for an invocation, which in our case, well, does a simple wait in a loop with a timeout, where we assume it should happen within that time, and if not, then you know, uh, fail the test. But that's the best we can do, actually. And then afterwards, please, now, if that has been invoked, then return that information. And then again, we can verify whether that is now while well, preparing, whether that is now in that status. So that means the communication was correct, right? Because that also means the, uh, the coffee shop has saved the update in the database. And then the same story again for the next status finished. Right? So then we tell the barista, hey, if you will be called again in the future, then please return um, that as appropriately. And now we wait for that invocation to happen. And then we check whether now also the coffee shop has been updated. OK, in order to test that, let's run this now in a different environment. Because now what I just did before, um, before I ran the Docker containers, like you know, in a production-like setting with the proper barista. Now what I want to run, I want to run this in this way that I run a mock instead, right? So I run my same coffee shop, um, run Liberty environment. I run the same coffee shop that I have here. And 
I run the barista system in while a mock. And then also, I'll show you this in a second, I run my application slightly differently, so I can actually access and update it much, much faster. Okay, so one, once that is the case, I can... Um, let's run this process as well. Okay, this works. I can check whether my application still works because that is curl. That should still be the case, so I can ask for the a coffee. Okay, and now no coffee in the system. I just restart it. Okay. And now I have this up and running, and I can actually start firing up my system tests. Now, that is the first test, the easy one, that just connects to my application and creates that order and sees whether it's in the system. Now, this runs very fast, and I will, run, uh, I will talk about effective testing in a second. Um, why does it run that fast? We, well, because the test, it doesn't do much. It's a simple JUnit test, and it just fires up the HTTP client that connects against the already running system, right? But now, the second one is more interesting, because now it will also create a coffee order, and then it will do this ping pong of status updates of the communication between the coffee order and the barista. So it will go to both systems and says, okay, check whether that communication is correct. And now this runs a little bit slower, but the reason why it runs slower is not, it's not the fault of the test. That's actually part of the business logic, right? Because the asynchronous communication happens, well, not immediately, but after, you know, always a two-second delay or so. So now both worked, and I can run that again. That's, by the way, another um, recommendation for especially end-to-end -end tests. You should write them in an idempotent way that you can just you know, rerun them and rerun them, and the tests don't have to rely on a prior state with, uh, in your application. Right? So you can just start them again and start them again, because I don't, you know, I don't assume that the system is in a specific state. I just you know, use IDs that are unique. So I can even run the test in parallel, right? like your users would later on. They also don't care whether you know, something's going on right now. They just access the system in parallel. So now this works really well. And that means I can you know, run that uh, system test um, against my system. Now, let's talk a little bit about how to be more effective in the development workflow. Because that is the other issue I always see in projects, that the build just takes way too long. The build including running tests, and especially proper end-to-end -end tests, right? And that is the reason why I write the test in that way. Because what I do, I run up my test environment, I started up once, and my actual test cases, you saw it, they are just HTTP clients that connect against that system, right? So the tests here run really quickly. I can run the tests in the IDE, or if I want, I can also, um, where is my project system test? I can go to the system test project and then say, this is actually should be a test, so I can run like something Maven, Maven verify, or Maven package, or Maven test. Now, now that is my system test project, right? And then it basically will run the same tests against now my running environment, right? So that is the case here. And then I run the create order test that takes a few seconds because of that extra, more complex scenario. And that works here as well. The point is the tests have to run fast. So if tests run you know, slower than a few seconds, this gets me out of my development work, of my development flow, right? Because what happens, I mean, I'm code here, right? And then I write some code, and I want to, uh, that code to be reflected immediately. So if that takes too long, then, you know, I will be distracted. I check my smartphone. I check social media, right? That's bad. And the second thing is I want my live code also to be reflected immediately. That's the reason why now I run my application actually not just as a Docker container, but in a way that I can show here, in a specific um, Maven plugin, Liberty Maven plugin, because I use Open Liberty, and I have some resources that I um, can show you um, on my blog with a video and things like that, how to run this in a development mode, Liberty Dev mode. So what does it do? It starts up my Liberty in a way where it listens to code changes, that are applied automatically. So what does it mean if I ch change something here? So for example, I have a root resource. Where is it? That gives me some information about the application. Like if I say curl, localhost, not orders, but just resources, then I will see some 
hypermedia-like links to, you know, where to create some orders and things like that. And now if I w would change that, then actually what I see, let's build this here, where's the index? I see a huge JSON that I create, and I can actually say, well, I enhance this now. For example, I say, hello, workstays. And now I apply that code, I, you know, change that code. What do it normally have to do in order to test this now? Well, I have to redeploy, right? I have to rebuild my project using Maven. I have to rebuild my Docker image and restart it locally. But what I do instead, I run this here in development mode, where it very, very quickly updates my application, and pretty much immediately, I see that change being reflected. That is now the special development mode of Open Liberty. Um, very nice feature that it's just super, super quickly. Because a Liberty server is really, really fast in startup and especially in deployment. So startup, you know, would take 10 to 20 seconds. But even 10 to 20 seconds is, I think, way too slow, right? Why? Because I want to have that quick development turnaround time. So if I change something, you know, I literally want my change to be reflected immediately. If I say, hello, Vox days, exclamation mark, then I want that to happen right away so that, that I simply can re execute this here and see the changes being reflected. Now, the same is true for the tests, right? If I change something on the code, it will be updated quickly. So that means I can immediately rerun my test as well, right? Where are they here? Test verify order. I can just say, OK, please execute the test again. And it also runs very fast. Why? Because it's just an HTTP client. It doesn't fire up stuff. I don't have to wait 10 seconds for something to happen. It just connects against the application that just very quickly has been updated. And that is the development workflow that I want to have, right? Because that means there is no waiting time. I don't even have the time you know, to drink my coffee or whatever. I literally change some code. It's being updated immediately. I can rerun my tests, and that's right there. All right. So that's about end-to-end -end tests. Do you have any questions so far? Right. No, that's good. Then let's go a little bit more into other test scopes. So an end-to-end -end test tests my application in the same way or in a similar way as it would run in production. And especially for a microservice world, that is very much required. This is why I started with that topic. Why? Because we have a lot of communication, right? The more we distribute our systems, the less, well, business logic we have per system, right? in comparison, and the more communication we have, right? Because all of these systems communicate with each other, and that means we have to verify the communication and the contracts between the systems much, much more. So it's much more important that we now write proper end-to-end -end tests that connect to the application in the same way as it would run in production later on, right? Because here in this, I can actually show you the Docker file. I'm running a Docker container, and that is the same w thing that I would run in production um, later on. So this uses the coffee shop. Um, it's an Open Liberty um, server here with my coffee shop application being deployed. And that will run the same thing later on in production. That is important because any configuration I change I make or anything that is different is a change that I didn't verify before I deployed to production. Right? So that is pretty much the key. And using this approach, what I showed you, I can build that up very, very effectively. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit more about code level tests. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with you know, unit tests and all these things. I don't want to show you uh, too much there, because that's pretty much straightforward. The most important thing is, I think, that we run our tests in you know, a very simple approach, in a very straightforward approach by not introducing too much test technology. So what I typically run, I run plain JUnit for my tests. And there is a reason for that. So for example, my tests run look something like this. A simple class, this is JUnit 5, no extension and no, if you use JUnit 4, at run with annotation. Why? This runs the fastest. So I, if, I run, if I use plain JUnit, I can run hundreds of tests in milliseconds, in no time, literally. And if you test a lot of business logic, then this is definitely the way to go in order to be more effective. Now, there are some other test scopes, mostly what is called code level integration tests, right? 
If you use Spring, then you have these at Spring context tests, right? If you use um, Java E, then you might use Achillean, you might use CDI unit, or any technology that fires up a simulated environment where you can already auto-wire and you know, pre-wire some stuff in your application. Why? To make your testing from the code a little bit more convenient. Right? Then you can have an at mock to mock some uh, dependencies. You can have at inject or at auto-wired, which sounds like a good idea, especially if you listen to some conference presentations, because if you only have one class, then this is easy to do. The problem is it just slows down your whole build. Right? So from my experience, if you have maybe build times that take you know, minutes and longer, this is typically the reason for it, right? Integration tests that run way too slow. Because for per default, all of the technology, they fire up a simulated environment, and they fire up that environment once per test class, right? Once per you know, a class that contains your test uh, cases. And that is, of course, a bad idea, just because you have to wait a long time, right? There is some optimizations uh, there that, you know, fire up that environment only once. But from my um, experience, what I mostly see in projects, that is not done very often. And the point is, if you fire up a simulated environment, it's not the whole verification anyway, right? Because in production, you run a different thing. So my point is, if you test business logic, you know, in a unit test way, or where you say you have a very small scope of logic that has a high complexity or, you know, a high, uh, where you have a high cohesion, something like an algorithm, something like a simple class that, simple class that does a lot of stuff, then it makes sense to write un unit tests. Otherwise, you know, you might actually focus on a more end-to-end -end level. Another thing with these tests on a code level, and that's a big problem, if you write a test that, you know, you fire up some mocks, either in a programmatic approach like here or in a, um, in a declarative approach with annotations. What happens if you refactor something on your production code, right? Well, we know what happens. Then you have hundreds of test classes that now won't compile anymore, right? And that you have to fix. And typically, there's no time for that in a project. So of course, you delete all these test classes, or at ignore, or at disable. And that's it. And they stay like this forever, right? And then you basically just threw away all of your tests, which is a problem. And the reason for that is that is just now way too brittle, way too you know, um, less uh, inflexible to accommodate for some changes, right? Because you literally nail down the whole structure of your application. But you should not do it in that way, because what you actually want to verify is whether the application behaves correctly, right? Not whether it has a certain structure, because that structure might be refactored. If it still does the same thing, then you afterwards, then your test should be green, right? So what I could do in this case, I could write some, um, I could use some code level integration test technology, right? Something that fires up an embedded um, enterprise application container or something like that. What I want to show you instead, what is, I think, more effective is what uh, in my book I introduced as component tests, or I think a better name is use case tests. These are code level integration tests that take multiple components that are involved in a use case, wire them up, but using a programmatic approach to do so in order to have very fast execution time and still integrate, test the integration of multiple components. And how that works is, I write a unit, uh, uh, sorry, a use case test that uses multiple components. For example, I might have this, uh, where is it, coffee shop. That is my, you know, I showed you that before. That is basically the um, use case class, you know, the boundary, the entrance point of my um, um, business use case. And then I have something like a order processor that does something else. And now, assuming I want to use both dependencies, both classes, you know, and wire them up correctly, then what I have here, I introduce each um, other components of the classes that, in, that um, inherit from these classes that are called test doubles. And what the test double do, they reside in a test scope and they pre-wire, well, anything that I need for my tests. So they pre-wire the mocking logic and they pre-wire any other dependencies that, I, that they use. So let's show you the test double for the coffee shop test. What it does, that resides in the test scope. 
it extends that class and it can you know, already set up some you know, other test doable, it can set up some mock, and it can set up some more business, some more higher abstraction behavior. So for example, verify whether you know, we have processed all the unfinished orders. And then what it will do in a lower level, well, it will do all of the mock veri verification logic, you know this, right, here in a programmatic approach, basically to be more maintainable in the test scope. Let me show you the test tube before the order processor. It does a very similar thing. It basically pre-wires and pre-sets up stuff that I have to do. Now, what we see, and that is now the benefit from it, our actually, that is our test scenario. That is our use case test. And we have a test here. For example, test the creation of an order. And then you can see the actual test code is now very readable and very simple. We just say, oh, new order, and now coffee shop create that order before it already has been set up correctly using that dependencies, by using these test doubles. And then we can have some you know, verification that now does the verification of you know, that lower level component that again resides in the test scope that makes, enables us to write our tests more effectively. Basically, it's the same approach that we have before. We just use delegation and separating the concerns here to, well, introduce code quality, right? Introduce another, a few other reusable components within our test scope. Now, this makes a lot of sense because we can write actually many, many use case tests. We can write many of these tests, and they're all maintainable. If something changes in, you know, how, uh, how my components are being set up, well, I can reflect the changes right here in the, you know, test double implementation, and I don't have to change 100 of test classes. And still, these tests run fast. Why? It's plain JUnit, right? They don't fire up any embedded uh, server or something like that, any Spring context, any um, Java E context or Jakarta. They just run quickly because everything is in a programmatic approach. And my programmatic approach works here because, well, I use code quality to make it more maintainable. Otherwise, it would be a lot of tests in each and every test class, right? And that would not be maintainable. So that is one way to deal with that situation that we want integration tests on a code level, but without fancy test runners that just make my test way too slow. And that is also a very important takeaway here is that rather focusing on fancy test technology, you know, like testing frameworks, I want to have a very simp simple approach with technology that just runs quickly. And I want rather to use code quality principles, you know, same things that you would run in, that you would use in production code, to make that more maintainable and more, um, more worthwhile. And by doing so, I can, you know, build up an approach that just works very effic um, efficiently while I develop to just, you know, I can change some code, I can immediately um, test the changes in an end-to-end like fashion if I have it deployed, what you saw before. I can rerun end-to-end system tests that connect against the running application, or in that case, of course, this runs fast. I can just run code level tests, um, either in the IDE or this, you know, Liberty development thing that I showed you before. Also accepts tests, I can just hit enter, and then it will run actually my unit tests and my integration tests. I also have some integration tests here. That is just a simple, well, smoke test that does the same thing. It just connects against my running environment. That is just very quickly to use. You know, it doesn't matter which approach um, I use to, um, to execute that. It's just, you know, easy to set up. For example, I could also say, please go to the coffee shop project and run only the integration tests. Maybe you've seen that. I can run integration tests from the Maven command line by saying Maven um, fail safe integration test and then run them there also works, and then I run the, you know, ITs um, there in, in this way. So, as some takeaways, um, most important thing is that you care about test code quality. It's probably the most important thing, and, you know, it's not forbidden to do some for a refactoring and to introduce some delega delegates. It's actually a very good idea, and the more complex your projects get, the more important that is. It's the same with managing test data, right? 
if you manage the test data in each and every test class individually and you know you have a lot of duplication well it makes sense to invest some time to have some reusable components like one golden source of test data within your test scope and things like that in order just to make it more maintainable reusable test components we saw that both on an end-to-end -end level and especially on a code level right you know these unit tests and integration tests that reside within the same uh, project in my coffee shop application and in order to, to stay especially productive it's very very important to care about fast feedback and the turnaround cycles you have right how long does your maven build take if you say you know maven build or gradle build without skipping tests does it take longer than five seconds hands up does it longer take longer than 30 seconds longer than one minute oh god longer than five minutes Oh God, okay, let's stop here. It just takes way too long, right? Because in order to develop efficiently, I want to verify whether that stuff works, what I just did. And of course, in a microservice world, I also want to verify the communication, right? Not just plain, J uh, plain unit test, that's easy, but also, you know, an end-to-end -end test fashion. So in any way, my unit test technology should run quickly, you know, less than one second, ideally. Sometimes you have business logic that requires you to take, you know, to run more slowly. Sometimes you have some stuff involved that actually takes longer. Okay, then it's not the fault of the test technology, then actually your tests do run slower. And then you might have things like, you know, let's parallelize something, let's, ex uh, let's exclude something from the test and run it later, maybe in the CI pipeline to, be, to get faster feedback, right? That might make sense, but it's very important that your test technology does not slow you down. And another very important thing that I often see violated is I want to separate the life cycles, the life cycle from my tests to the life cycle from my test environment. What you saw in my system test that I did, I fired up some Docker containers using some shell scripts, or you know you can use Docker Compose, or if you're cool, you can uh, run your own Kubernetes cluster or your OpenShift cluster locally, whatever. But you want to fire that up once before you start working in the morning, you know, while you fire it up, that might take a while, that might take a few seconds or minutes, and you can drink your coffee. But once that is fired up, I don't want to wait anymore, right? I don't want that stuff to be fired up each and every time I test something, because that is just way too slow. And everything that you include within your test class, right, like an extension, like a test runner that starts up a bunch of things, that will just slow you down. So that is the reason why I'm actually not a big fan of all these test frameworks that introduce um, some stuff like, you know, spring context tests like Achillean, like CDI unit. Uh, test containers is another thing that it's nice to have some Java API. And um, it basically, test containers is a um, test frameworks that make, uh, make it easier to use Docker containers in your Java code. So it's basically a, doc, uh, a Java wrapper that you know, starts up your Docker containers and you can have some declarative annotations to say, now please start up that database with this Docker image and you know, wire it up, which is nice to use as a, a Java developer, but actually it's, they're working on some features to make that a little bit more efficient. But what it does right now, it always starts up a new container if you run that test. And even if your, if your Docker container um, starts in five seconds or 10 seconds, it's too slow. It's five or ten seconds. I don't want to wait five or ten seconds every time I run my test. I want that to be there right away. So I want some um, thing that, all, that is already running and that I can reuse, which of course requires that my tests are written in an island potent way, but that's a good idea anyway. And then if I do that, actually for me the simplest way is to, you know, just fire up the Docker containers anyway using shell scripts if you want, using Docker Compose or anything else first and then separate that from my tests. And the tests are very simple. They are just you know, something like um, um, HTTP clients that connect against that environment. What that also enables me, if I separate these life cycles, is to reuse that stuff for other tests. Right? I might have a simple smoke test, what I wrote uh, here, or I might run you know, a, um, a test that involves a mock server. I might get, go one step further and say, now we have a fully fledged end-to-end -end test with the actual barista. Then I can reuse the same stuff, but it, because it's just an HTTP client, it will connect against the other cluster as well. And then I just reconfigure that test to say, oh, instead of local host, now run it with dash D coffee shop test host to go against my Kubernetes cluster. 
or my staging environment, or my test environment, or even production, if you like. Right? You can reuse these components for other things, and this makes it just so much more worthwhile. And it's very hard to do that if you tangle your life cycles together within one test class. So I think that is just the easiest approach to do. And you only see that once you go to a more complex project. Right? If you have a very simple Hello World example, when then you can write your one test with very few code, and it still runs in five seconds in total, and that's okay, right? But if you get more complex, you actually see the implications how long your test run. Um, reusable item potent test scenarios, I just talked about that. And about test frameworks, so I use plain JUnit with Mokita with SRJ. I think that's a very um, effective combination. I know some developers who are big fans of you know, Spock testing with Groovy, of Scala tests, of other things. I would just say, okay, if you're a really big Groovy fan and you know, your projects and developers are very effective with it and you set up your build anyway, then you know, go ahead and do it. But I would say the test code quality is way, way more important, right? Because especially once the more, the more complex your project is, that complexity that you manage by having proper test code quality you know, is that big. And if you introduce another test framework, then you add a little bit of syntactical sugar if you care about that, well, you can do it, but I don't care about that much. It's much more important to, cast, to care about that test score quality in the first place. I have one exception that I sometimes use um, with you know, more business-focused people. It's called con uh, Cucumber Test. Cucumber is you know, like a behavior-driven uh, BDD testing to say, OK, you can write in a more you know, human-readable manner what you want to test here, that is now the verification of, you know, create some coffee here, create some espresso from Colombia, and so on and so forth. And then you can have scenarios where, you know, you fired it up. Either that, or if you're fancy, you're using some parameters and some tables to say, oh, for example, you know, espresso from Colombia, that should be accepted, right? Espresso from Germany, well, Germany has no coffee, that should be rejected, right? And then as a developer, what you do, well, you can run your step definitions to say, OK, what does it actually mean if I say, I create an order with this from that? And then you can write that matching. And then, well, what you do, and this is now very important, that you have the same reusable components, the same test score quality to make that more maintainable. right? And then you implement what that means. This can be helpful if you have less technical people, like you know, business domain experts, that, ver that basically create the test cases, again, on that abstract level, on exactly this level, and then you have somebody else implementing it. What I really like about that approach is it very much forces you to introduce that abstraction. So here, care, you know, only care about these, um, um, these sentences that pretty much match what I wrote in my comments, right? That is pretty much the same. Create coffee order espresso from Colombia. Then orders should be accepted. Orders should be in the system or whatever. Right? That is exactly the same thing. And then afterwards, in that delegation, you implement how it is done. That is one hand uh, on one thing that is sometimes used. And you know the cucumber tests I ran them before. They um, you know fast enough, I would say. And then that is one exception where you have a different uh, runner. That's um, JUnit 4, and then you know they run still kind of okay. That is one thing. On the other hand, even if you have less technical people, what I actually had is domain experts that had no clue about Java who were actually quite happy with reading this. Right? I mean, if you think about it. Imagine for a second you're not a Java programmer, you have no clue about the syntax, and try to parse the following lines. Right. Order, order, equal sign, new order, some weird bracket, espresso, Colombia, right? If you think about it as a human and say, new order, espresso, Colombia, right? It's probably something with an order with espresso from Colombia, right? Next line, order system, create order. Well, it will probably create some order with espresso from Colombia, right? If you think about it, even if you wonder why this bracket and this uh, semicolon here looks a little bit weird as a human being, but that is basically you know, what, you can, uh, what you do. And I even had business people who were totally happy with that and say, oh, I can understand it. Right? Looks a little bit weird, but that's fine. If you want more abstract level, well, then you can write a, a cucumber test, what I just did before. But sometimes people are even happy with that, 
if you care about code quality, right? That's readability up to the point that a normal mortal without being a Java developer can read it as well. And that would be the ideal. Then you can actually just write this in Java, and then you go. If you want to be more fancy, then you can use another test technology, but that's optional. So these are the more, most important things, and especially for, you know, for real-world projects and for most more complex setups, these are the things to care about. Most important thing is that you're really effective in running your tests, how to define them, that they are maintainable, and that you can run them quickly with really fast turnarounds. Turnarounds in a time like, you know, you do it and instantly you get some feedback. I have a very good metric for myself. If I say, if I run any action, right? If I do something, hit enter, and then I drink my coffee, take a sip from my coffee cup and put it back, and then it needs to be finished, right? Like five seconds or so. If it takes longer, that's too slow. And if we use modern approaches, and especially modern technology, like the Open Liberty development mode, what I showed you, and proper um, approaches to separate life cycles from tests, then we can get there. And then I think testing can be a topic that also can be a little bit more joyful and a little bit more fun to do. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. So you didn't ask any questions. If you have some questions, I have actually three t-shirts for you, one in small, one in medium, one in large. Yeah. Or oh, not for a t-shirt, you can ask a question anyway. And I have stickers, please. So, oh, thank you. So for example, you showed us how you uh, separated your environment. You had yes. Like the Docker stuff, speed yes. up. But you also had a database there, right? I also had a database in this so case, how, yeah. How do you handle that? Each test just writes stuff to the database. I'm yes. assuming you also do that. Yes. So do you clean up every time? Um, uh, good question. It depends on your test scenarios. Usually I don't clean up if I don't have to clean up because then it's also, you know, it's easier to write the test just in an idempotent way and you just add stuff, add stuff. And that's also very similar to what a user would do in your application, right? They also typically don't clean up. If you have to clean up, or you typically have to clean up if some more complex test scenario re um, um, requires a particular state, right? A particular state that's in your application up front, then that test scenario might clean up. So then what I would do just to make it more you know, efficient, use some APIs, like, you know, I don't know, HTTP, and then write them in the same way in a, um, in a client in your test scenario to clean up first. What you lose then is basically the um, ability to run them in parallel, right? Because then it's very much you have to do this step first, then this step, then this step, then you're done. If you can avoid it, I would avoid it because then you know you have idempotent tests, you can run them in parallel. If you have to, because your use case requires it, you know, then you have to run them separately. But that's also uh, possible. Typically, I, I use you know no cleanup first. If I can, then I use um, a cleanup or um, a load of uh, data up front in the same test scenario. And if for some reason it's more complex, then you might also be able to just directly connect to the database and do whatever you have to do. But just make it manageable within your test scenario so it's idempotent and you know it's obvious what you do. Otherwise, you know you lose the overview uh, later on. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. How does it work for these type of test code quality tools like Docker? How does it work with test code quality tools? What do you mean? You what you want to put into you want the sonar to also check your test code or uh, usually yes, sonar. Uh -huh. Check your test code and contains it doesn't. You can do that. It's actually a good idea, yeah. Oh, you mean assertions in the test in the in the test method directly? Okay, well that is that is an issue. You actually, I mean, it's then it's not compatible with more proper test code because what you want you want some assertion within somewhere in your test execution, right? Whether it's here or down there. Yeah, exactly. Then take a better code quality tool. <laughs> well, I also use Sona, but you know it, it depends what you're then testing there. 
So now on a, on a test code level, you might more be interested in the uh, te test coverage of, you know, especially uh, methods that have a high complexity or a high density of you know, complexity, circulomatic complexity, to especially, you know, test them and have a coverage for them. But yeah, but good point, yes? How do you measure, measure code coverage? Uh, typically, and so code coverage is an important topic because I've seen a lot of um, what's the called metrics-driven development, right? That you just care about your code coverage being greater than a certain value, which is to complete, you know, sorry, bullshit, because it doesn't even tell you that you have to have assertions. Just if you run your code, you have that coverage. And that doesn't tell you anything, especially if you run getters and setters. Well, you can exclude them as well, but the point is what I care about, I would be, if you want to care about metrics, and sometimes they can help, especially they can detect some hotspots that are, where have been unknown or something, that have been not tested. I want some coverage for some piece of code that especially has a high density of complexity. That means if you have a method or a class that has a cyclomatic complexity that is higher above a certain value, then that needs to be covered. And I don't want to cover uh, methods that have, you know, super low co uh, cyclomatic complexity, where you don't have any if-else branch, right? If that makes sense. So if you have a high um, density of complexity, something like an algorithm, right? Like one single class that does a lot of stuff. Of course, I do want to unit test that a lot, and I want to, that class to, be, class to be covered. If I have something that mainly does orchestration or a POJO, getters and setters, I don't necessarily want to cover that, or it is um, already being covered. When it comes to coverage, there's actually a nice hack that you can do. You can run your uh, application server or your runtime, like Liberty, with uh, Jacoco, you know, test coverage, as a Java agent, and then you fire up the server in a normal mode, you know, like locally, and then what you do, you run your end-to-end -end tests, you run your system tests, and afterwards you gather the coverage information. And what you do get then is a very uh, nice uh, hack or workaround. You get the coverage of your end-to-end -end tests, you see whether you forgot to write some end-to-end -end tests for your code, because what happens if you know you have code that is not covered, then it's actually dead code, right? Either it's dead code and it's not being used, or you did not cover a certain test in your end-to-end -end test scenario. You start the actual server with an agent that you know just gathers uh, the uh, coverage, and then r you run your test suite against that server. That's a nice workaround, and then you get way you know numbers that are way more reasonable or way more useful. Thank you.